Now in our last lesson in uh, chapter 18, um, we studied John's description of Jesus' final days as he focused on the Lord's betrayal by uh, Judas and uh, the trials uh, in front of the uh, various Jewish leaders. And I, I explained to you that Jesus, you know, just a little bit of uh, a detail here because the different writers you know, have different details. So to keep the, keep the, the action straight here, uh, he first appeared before Annas, the former high priest and current high priest's father-in-law, and that was a kind of a preliminary hearing. You know, they were kind of probing to try to find a charge to bring against him. Then he was sent to appear before the official high priest, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin in order to be formally charged and sentenced. And then he went to Caiaphas uh, a second time, so he went twice, once late at night and once early in the morning. Next, the Jews brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, in order to persuade him to carry out the death sentence, something, as we know, the Jews were not permitted to do on their own. Now, John doesn't mention this in, in his gospel, but Luke does in Luke chapter 23, uh, that Pilate, learning that Jesus is from Galilee, sends him to stand before Herod, who ruled the northern section and who was in Jerusalem uh, at that time. Uh, more or less, uh, the idea was, hey, let Herod deal with him. You know, I got a problem here, this guy's causing trouble. These Jews, they want me to put this guy to death. Oh, you're from the north. Oh, oh well, uh, Herod's in town. Let's go see Herod. You know, kind of one of these deals, you know, move him along. Maybe Herod can do something with this guy. And of course, we learn that Herod doesn't get anywhere with Jesus. Jesus remains silent. And so Pilate, once again takes custody of Jesus, begins to question him about his claims, and Jesus in turn begins to question Pilate concerning his faith. And it is at this point that Pilate breaks off the conversation and returns uh, to the Jews in order to inform them of his uh, views concerning Jesus and their request to have him executed. So Pilate has not been moved to believe in Jesus as the king of another world, but he also has not been persuaded to believe that the charges against Jesus are valid. You know, he's really stuck. You know, uh, he, he doesn't believe he's the, any kind of king, but he also doesn't believe that he's worthy of you know, being uh, uh, sent to death. So that's where we're at. You know, second time now in front of Pilate, uh, so let's focus in on that particular trial beginning in chapter 18, verse 38. It says the following, and when he had said this, this is Pilate now, and when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Uh, do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas uh, was a robber. So uh, Pilate really believes that Jesus is innocent of the charges and not subject to death, but he doesn't release him either. You know, a concession to the Jewish leaders who are pressing him for some type of action. You know, they're saying, do something, do something. Now the other gospel writers provide us with information that at this point, Pilate, learning of Jesus' origins in Galilee, as I mentioned before, decides to send Jesus to be questioned by Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. Now, Herod was one of the sons of Herod the Great, and Herod the Great was the king when Jesus was born. It was that Herod. When Herod died, his kingdom was split up among his sons, and Herod Jr., if you wish, received the portion of land in the northern area around Galilee. Uh, the term the Tetrarch, we see that often, the Tetrarch is a Greek term that was used by the Romans to refer to a person who ruled over part of a province. Okay? Kind of a lesser official, if you wish, uh, as Herod did in the northern part where Galilee was. So Jesus meets briefly with Herod, as I mentioned before, but nothing is found to Pilate's advantage, so Jesus is returned to the Roman governor for further questioning. So it's at this point that Pilate attempts to set Jesus free 
within a Jewish law or tradition to minimize the negative impact that this might have. You know, he figures out, hey, wait a minute, there's a tradition here where I release a prisoner, this could be my out. I could get myself out of this problem here. Now, what he should have done, he should have simply let Jesus go because as the judge, he found no guilt in him. I mean, he was the judge. They brought their charges, he questioned Jesus, found no guilt in him, he should have simply let him go. So, and he doesn't. He's trying to find another way out, he's trying to appease, you know, he's trying to appease the Jewish leaders, so on and so forth. So the custom, as we're familiar with, uh, was to present two prisoners before the people at this time and let them choose one for freedom, and this was uh, usually done during the Passover. Now the insult to the Jews um, is that he is innocent, Jesus is innocent, and he's put against a man who is convicted as a thief and a murderer. Uh, Matthew tells us this in Matthew 27, Mark 15 also mentions this fact. So Pilate is confident at first that the people will choose Jesus. How could they not choose Jesus? You know, he's done good, he's healed people, he's, you know, I mean, this guy or this other guy who's been convicted and proven to be a murderer and a thief, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. But what do they do? You know, they, don't, <laughs> they don't choose Jesus. You know, Pilate, the problem is, Pilate can't help provoking the Jewish leaders by offering Jesus up as their king. You know, like when you can't help yourself? You know, you know like there's somebody you don't like, you know, and you're trying to be nice, you're trying to be diplomatic, but you just can't help yourself but framing things in such a way that's just going to needle them. Well, that's Pilate, he just can't help himself. You can imagine the laughter of the Roman soldiers and the anger of the Jewish leaders and the resentment of the people when called on to choose between their king. Who do you want me to set free? Your king, quote? Your king? <laughs> or this guy over here, Barabbas. Terrorist, murderer, thief. So to his surprise, the crowd, well salted with the leaders, people, and followers, Clamping down on any defense of Jesus, they cry out to save Barabbas. So frustrated in his attempt to free Jesus in this way, Pilate's going to try another course of action. So let's read chapter 19 this time. And Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews! and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now, seeing that Jesus, uh, or rather that the Jews are wanting blood, Pilate goes ahead and he tortures him. You know, the mocking and the crown of thorns and the robe are an attempt to humiliate and discredit Jesus in front of the crowd. After the ordeal with the soldiers, Jesus is led back out naked. That's how prisoners were scourged, naked. And all they do is put a crown of thorns on him in an old robe, probably one worn by the soldiers. And Pilate once again pronounces him innocent and introduces him in a different way this time. First time he says, hey, here's your king. Who do you want, your king or Barabbas? This time he doesn't say that. This time he says, here he is, the man. Not the king, the man. The idea is that they should have no fear of this person who may claim to be a king, but we've cut this guy down to size. Does he look like a king now? He's not much of a king, is he? Look at him, he's bleeding. We've broken him down. So you have nothing to worry about this fellow here being a king. And so Pilate has three goals. First, he doesn't want to execute a man who is clearly innocent and thus cause a possible uproar with the people because he knows that this Jesus is a very popular guy. Secondly, he wants to placate the Jewish leaders who want him to just do something about this troublemaker. 
So you, know, you have a troublemaker, what do you do? Well, you break his spirit, you, you, know, you humiliate him in front, of the, in front of his own people. And then thirdly, he just cannot help insulting and belittling these people that he despises and he knows that they despise him. So in his mind, torturing and humiliating Jesus and then releasing him to the Jews will accomplish all three of his goals. So let's see what happens. We know what happens, but let's read anyways. Beginning in verse six, he says, so when the chief uh, priests and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify, crucify. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and I have the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So his attempt to get the crowd to you know, agree with him uh, in releasing Jesus has failed as they respond to the torture with cries of crucifixion. Not enough, they said. That's not enough. We want this guy to go. So Pilate again repeats that he finds no basis to execute this person and he tells them to do it. If they want him, you know, if you want him dead so badly, you do it. Of course, this is a provocation to the Jews because he and they know that they don't have such authority. But the Jews, they perceive a, a weakness in Pilate's reply. He said, I find no guilt in him. And the Jews reply that they, they have a law, a Jewish law, and by that law he should die. You notice what's going on here? In other words, if you have no law or reason to do this, to convict him, well, we do. We do have a law. We do have a reason. Use our law. Use our law in order to do the deed. So at this point, they reveal the true reason for their desire to have him executed, and that is his claim of divinity. In other words, by Jewish law, if someone who claims to be divine and isn't, obviously, the, the penalty is death. So they're saying, okay, if by Roman law you don't find any guilt in him, we get it, we understand you can't use Roman law to, to convict him and to uh, execute him. But you know what? We have a law, and by our law he's, he's committed a capital offense, so use our law to do the deed. And so this startles Pilate because Listen, as a pagan, he had no belief or understanding of the Jewish Messiah and his claims, but his own background as a Roman was filled with Roman gods and mythology, so on and so forth. Could this man be one of those? I mean, he was a skeptic, but Jesus' demeanor and reputation were unusual, and this latest revelation by the Jews, it frightened him. Could he have inadvertently tortured one of the Roman gods that were said to mingle at times with men? And if so, what would the gods do to him because of this? All of a sudden, oh, it's getting personal now. So Pilate returns to question Jesus, but this time the questioning is a little more urgent, more personal, because Pilate himself may be involved. Now Pilate asks where Jesus is from. He wants more details about his identity, but Jesus doesn't give him any reply. I mean, he's already told him who he is, and Pilate has not believed, so there's no further, he's not giving him any further information. Frustrated, Pilate alludes to his power to free or to execute him, hoping perhaps that this threat or this offer will move Jesus to explain his identity. But you know what? Jesus does not expand a person's knowledge of himself without faith. When it comes to Christianity, when it comes to faith, first there's faith, then there's knowledge. You want to know Jesus? 
You have to believe first. What does the Bible say? He who comes to God must first believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him in Hebrews. And so Jesus responds by commenting on Pilate's perception of his own power. Pilate says, I've got the power to release you or to kill you. And Jesus said, hey, let me tell you about power. He tells him two things. One, he does not have the authority over his life. Someone else has given him this authority and this power. We know that God is the one who permits and appoints secular leaders, good or bad, and that's what Jesus is referring to. All leadership is granted by God. Even the Roman emperor couldn't be the Roman emperor had not God permitted that. So Jesus knows this and He kind of informs Pilate of this. And even the wrongs that He is doing now are secondary to the wrongs committed by the Jews who originally arrested and falsely tried and accused Him. So Jesus is saying, but you want to talk about power? Let me tell you about power. The only reason you have power is because somebody else gave it to you. And when the judgment comes, there are others that are way more guilty than you are because of what they've done. So let's keep going, verses 12 to 16. He says, as a result of this, Pilate made efforts to uh, release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. So they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So, he handed him, so then he handed him over to them to be crucified. You know, the end game here in Pilate's effort to release Jesus comes into view as the Jews zero in on his vulnerability. He thinks he's provoking the Jews, he thinks he's manipulating them, but what's really happening is they're manipulating him. He's the one that's being played here. He's the one being shaped. You know, until this time, their focus has been on Jesus and their desire to have Him you know, executed. But the Jewish leaders have outwitted Pilate in providing all that he needs to carry out the execution. Watch. First of all, they've provided him with a charge, sedition. That was the char that's the official charge, sedition. I mean, he claimed rulership. You couldn't do that in the Roman Empire, claim that you were a governor or a king or anything like that. Secondly, they've given him a legal framework to condemn him uh, since he can't do it based on Roman law. So he can do it based on Jewish law. He can condemn Jesus using their interpretation of Jewish law. Thirdly, they also provided motivation by suggesting that releasing Jesus would be contrary to Caesar's wish. You know, it's like saying, you, know, you do this, we're going to tell the boss. It's pretty common stuff, isn't it? Haven't we all experienced that somewhere or fashion? Somebody goes around us and tells our supervisor something. That's exactly what they're, they're doing here. And then, the Jews finished their assault on Pilate by declaring that in doing this thing, he will win their greater loyalty to Rome. I mean, if you were a, if you were a Roman official in those days, you know, a governor moving up in the organization, the last place you wanted to be was you know, Palestine. You didn't want to be there. That, that was the outback. You know? it, it, it's like being, well, I, I was going to say something, but you know, it would be like you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the diplomat you know, on, on, a, on, an, on a little island somewhere out in the Pacific, you know, the U.S. representative. You know? Nowheresville, your career was like in a dead end if you were where Pilate was. And so the last thing he needs is to fumble the ball in this place, because I mean, there'll be no, there's nowhere else to go. The, the Roman Empire doesn't extend much further than, than that. <laughs> so they know how to play this guy. 
They said, hey, you, you, know, you scratch our back, we'll scratch your back. You know, we'll cooperate with you. And so against his conscience, I don't know if you were keeping count, but Pilate declared Jesus innocent three times. Imagine a judge in a courtroom today who would listen to all the evidence and all the witnesses and say, I find the defendant innocent. I find him innocent. I find him innocent. Okay, here's the, here's the, here's the verdict. <laughs> You're going to the electric chair. You know, that's exactly what happened here. So against his better judgment, against the law, against his conscience, Pilate sends Jesus to his death thinking that in doing so, doing so, he will appease the Jewish leaders, he'll avoid civil turmoil, and secure his own position in government. Of course, from hindsight, we look back a scant, a few decades into the future, what happens? <laughs> Rome has to send armies to Jerusalem to kind of wipe it off the face of the earth. So that cooperation talk didn't last for very long. You know, he was Caesar's governor, but a riot and sustained complaints about his loyalty to Rome and competence could be a threat to his position and his career. So uh, let's step back here a little bit, shall we, and get a, you know, a wider view. Notice that another cycle is complete as Jesus, with his silence and his words and his demeanor, proclaims his identity and this Roman official, in the end, disbelieves and he acts on his disbelief by sending Jesus to an execution that was clearly illegal. You were not allowed to execute a person found innocent at trial. I mean, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's been pretty much pretty standard in any, any society. Remember, we, you know, we, we've always been talking about this cycle. You know, Jesus demonstrates his divinity in some way or another. People believe and respond or people disbelieve and respond. So we see the same thing here with Pilate. All right, so we move on to the crucifixion, verse 17, read that. So they took Jesus therefore and went out bearing His own cross to that place called the place of, the, of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified Him and with Him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So John, you know, he doesn't give a whole lot of detail concerning the further torture and the process of crucifixion. This has been done by the other uh, gospel writers. He actually follows more on his theme of Jesus' identity, Jesus identity in describing the ongoing debate between the Jewish leaders and Pilate. So Pilate gets the last word by combining what the Jews claimed Jesus to be and what Jesus himself said about his identity. They said, well, he was just a guy from Nazarene, and he said, no, I'm the king. You know? So he puts it all there together. His intent, of course, was to further insult the Jews. He just couldn't help himself. I mean, he just couldn't help it. Uh, and their intent, of course, was to both kill and discredit Jesus. But in the end, what was written in languages for all the world to read was the truth. Here on this cross is Jesus, the man from Nazarene, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the God-man, Jesus the King of the Jews. So despite the protest of the Jewish leaders, Pilate manages to get the final say, and in doing so, he proclaims the truth. Both he and the Jews missed. So we keep reading, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took His outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic, was seamless, woven in one place. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his, he said to his mother, woman, uh, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. So there are five pieces of uh, clothing worn by Jewish men, a head covering, a turban to protect from the sun, a tunic, which was worn close to the body, a pair of sandals for the feet, of course, a girdle or a sash, which was worn around the waist to secure a fifth piece, which was an outer robe. The loincloth was not a valuable piece and of such nature as to simply be discarded. So soldiers who did the execution divided the victim's personal effects between them. This was the, this was the custom of the time. John, along with the women, was an witness, and he says that four soldiers each took one piece of clothing for themselves, and rather than tear up and ruin a good quality, a seamless robe, they, they cast lots uh, for it. Now the significance of this seemingly unimportant detail is that it fulfilled a prophecy concerning the details of the Messiah's death made by David some 800 years before in Psalm 22, 18. Even the small detail of how his clothing uh, you know, was distributed afterwards was spoken of in the Old Testament. Okay? Again, without a word or gesture, Jesus is proclaiming his identity. You know, they take off his clothes to humiliate him and, and they gamble to, to, to you know, cast lot to, to get it. And in that humiliating act, he can, he's still declaring his divinity because that act fulfills prophecy. Um, so note that there were three Marys at the scene. There was Mary, Jesus' mother. There was another Mary, and the idea is that the, uh, Mary, the, the, the Jewish form of that word, has many different forms that we continually translate into the word Mary. So there was Mary, the sister of the Lord's mother, a wife of an early disciple whose name was Clopas. And many people believe that Clopas was the brother of Joseph. That's not a biblical idea, okay? That's historical, right? A lot of historians, uh, early, histor early church historians. The idea being that two brothers married two sisters, okay? And then there was Mary from Magdala, a town in Galilee. Uh, Jesus cast spirits out of her and she was a faithful disciple of Jesus. So Jesus arranges for the care of his widowed mother, which is his duty as the eldest son. That's what the eldest son did. He took care of the parents. Um, and and you know, sometimes we wonder, well, you know, why didn't she go to, because he had brothers. Well, she didn't go to the brothers because the brothers were not there. But John was there, a disciple, an apostle. So he leaves her in the care of one who had a special love for him. And now this love will be there for his mother. At that moment, only one apostle and friend was near. Even his, early, uh, his uh, earthly brothers and sisters, who would later believe, were not there. And so to him uh, goes this special responsibility. You know, it's not hard to understand this, this this feeling? I mean, when Lisa and I, when our children were young, even though Lisa and I had family, you know, my mom and her parents, and she had brothers and sisters and so on and so forth, in our will, we dictated that in the event of our death, our children would be cared for by brothers and sisters in the Lord, because no one in our family were believers. None, none, there was no one who was a member of the church in our family. And so if, in the event of our death, we want to make sure that our children grew up in a Christian household. And so Jesus does exactly the same thing here in leaving the care of His mother in the hands of one person who was there and who also loved Him and also believed in Him at the time. All right, verse 28. Uh, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave, over, uh, he gave up his uh, spirit. So all things accomplished, meaning all the things that the Father through the scriptures foretold that he would do, 
including the suffering and death on the cross, all of that is done. I mean, right down to the taking off of his clothes you know, and, and sharing it, that last thing had to be done as well. Note that Jesus controls even this portion of the proceedings in that He gave up His spirit. It didn't simply leave Him. He had control over this moment of death because of two reasons. One, He had no sin and so death could not overpower Him. He decided, He said, okay, now, it's finished now, time to go. And He completed all the things set before Him by the Father and recorded um, in scripture and uh, would not give up the spirit before all of these things were accomplished. So with this sacrifice of his perfect life, Jesus fulfills all the requirements of the law. He pays the moral debt for our sins. He opens the door to forgiveness for all men based on his sacrifice. So very important to understand, this is the core idea of the gospel. He makes restitution for all of the sins of men. He does the payback. So many times Christians, you know, they, they continue to feel guilty. You know? I mean, to, I, I've met Christians 20 years after their baptism, they're still feeling guilty about something they did in the past. Well, you know, some, something they just couldn't fix themselves. Young girl had an abortion at 17, she's now 37 happily married, two kids, still carrying that burden. You know why? Because she couldn't go back and fix that thing. If only we would understand that the fixing of sin, the making of restitution to God, is completely made by Jesus on the cross. All of it, everything, every, the restitution for every single despicable thing that we've ever done, the restitution for it is made on the cross. That is such a comforting thought. I mean, that's why the good news is good news. It isn't good news if we have to go back and fix all, you know, where's the good news of the gospel if you have to go back and fix all the things you did in the past? You know, pay, pay back the person you cheated 40 years ago on a land deal, uh, whatever. Would you have to adopt a child because you, you, you aborted a child to, to pay back for that? This nonsense of you know, when I hear people say, well, you know, the people have gone through a divorce. You know, oh, you have to divorce this, this person, go all the way back and remarry the original. To do what? To make restitution? God makes the restitution. That, that's the good news. That's what motivates people to live righteously because God has been so good to them to forgive their sins. All right, well, sorry, went into a preaching mode there. <laughs> hey, you can't help it when you hear the gospel. You've got, to, you've got to talk about the good news. All right, so next time we're going to continue as John describes the most important event that will separate believers from non-believers for all time. And that's the end of our lesson. We're coming close, close to the end of our, of our series here. All right, thank you very much for your attention.